Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind to both employees and customers love and support. Thanks to BizSimply for sponsoring this episode as our show partner. And BizSimply is the all-in-one HR, workforce management, roads and operations software designed and built by hospitality experts to make every shift run like clockwork. And we join forces to help the industry to find new ways to become even more innovative in how we lead our people, how we operate, to how we grow our businesses, to how we serve our customers. Together, we want to share strategies and tools that can make the industry thrive long-term, not just survive. Surround yourself with really good people. Ed Stone did that when he formed EDSA. It was different than his father's company. It, it, he surrounded himself with what he called equals, and he everybody contributed to making a great company. And and you can't do it all yourself. You have to really rely on your partners and and your colleagues in the business. And so you know, just bring smart people to the table, collaborate. This is Rich Centuella, Principal and Director at EDSA, and they are a company with over six decades of experience and hundreds of completed projects on six continents, within planning, landscape architecture, and urban design, widely recognized for their abilities to deal with complex projects in the following sectors, hotels, resorts, and community. Rich shares some of the amazing projects they've been working on over the years, like the Atlantis brand and many others. And it gives an amazing overview over the current mega trends for hospitality right now and how you can transform your properties to better fit the demands of the customers and the employees. And we discuss the importance of getting sustainability right now as you build and refurb your properties. He shares how they have built a company that has a great company culture that drives innovation and results. And that all has happened by involving people in the decision making from the first day they start there, no matter title or rank. And he shares some of the other methods and principles they use to drive this culture. And he believes that all this combined is the key to longevity of their company. Before you tune in, please sign up for our weekly newsletter, packed with more Maverick insights, strategies and tools. Find the link in the show notes or visit hospitalitymavericks.com. Grab your coffee and notebook. There's some great insights in here in this conversation on the future of hospitality and how to build culture. Enjoy. I'm super excited about today's conversation because uh, we had a couple of conversations about these before on the show, but We've gone through a, a pandemic, or we're we still in a pandemic. We actually discussed this, uh, me and uh, Rich, as our guest today, before we went live. Uh, yeah, and we are probably still figuring it out, and there's still like things we need to do different. Also, we has as consumers and employees change. We have different demands to the physical environment we're in, and the experience we want from that. And that's exactly what we're going to touch on today. Uh, as part of the conversation and many, many other things, I'm sure, from, from my previous uh, conversation with Rich. But with that said, welcome to the show, Rich. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Michael. It's uh, it's great to be here. Yeah, and you're joining us from uh, from the US. So it's a uh, early morning at your and afternoon here in the UK. It's a little bit after 9 a.m., so it's not too early. Um, we start very early these days because of international work. So um, I'm already ready for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, when we get through this, there will be lunch, I'm sure, on the other side. Tell us a bit about what your your company is all about, the purpose, you know, the, the rich heritage that's in the company, and what is the kind of projects you're working up on across the, the globe? Well, EDSA is a uh, landscape architecture planning and urban design firm. We were founded in 1960 in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where we still have our headquarters. Our founder was Edward Durrell Stone Jr. And Ed's father in the uh, 40s through the 70s was a world famous building architect. Um, Ed Sr. designed the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC, was the original architect on the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, um, designed US embassies around the world. And um, 
you know, actually made the cover of Time magazine in 1958 for the U.S. Exposition in Brussels. Um, but um, there's a, a family legacy there of working around the world. And, um, and he passed that on to his son, who had a separate company that focused on landscape architecture, not buildings. But we've taken that, that legacy and, um, and we still have an international practice. I think this year alone, we've touched over 60 countries and, um, and, uh, and we continue to uh, work around the globe. Um, we're about 170 people um, based in several offices, but we're headquartered in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And, uh, you know, when you go on your website and the conversations we had, you, you've you been working on some quite exciting landmarks around the globe. And people are listening in will probably say, oh, I've maybe been at some of them. And I know people would have been at some of these landmark theme parks, uh, hotels and so on. But also with always with this is experience bit connected to it. Can Can you tell a bit about how you actually some of the projects and how you approach this work? Yeah, um, we've uh, had the, you know, the privilege of working on, on projects all over the world and, 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 and largely in part to our hospitality uh, focus and our, and our hospitality experience. So we've, we've worked on resort projects all over the world um, and, and some um, as, as fun and exciting as the Atlantis project in the Bahamas, where we've now taken that brand to Dubai and China. And uh, we're working on a few other locations for Atlantis. Um, We've done a lot of work for the other luxury brands around the world. We have a a Rosewood Hotel that we developed with the Ferragamo family in Tuscany, Italy. Um, We've done a lot of work in uh, in Mexico. Um, The whole Mayacoba um, development in uh, in uh, Mexico on the coast is uh, is an amazing place to uh, with several different luxury brand hotels um and uh, you know so we've we've just been really lucky to work with great clients and great locations around the world we've done a lot of work in dubai i think some of the best projects in dubai are the projects that we've worked on now not just because of us because of a great team that we got a chance to work with but um but it's the it's the highest quality and 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 uh, the most enjoyable projects when i visit dubai i love staying in projects that we've worked on and uh you know atlantis is probably as you you mentioned people lots of people know that especially when it comes to europe for for dubai and that's actually one of the landmarks i've been at myself like an incredible experience just from uh, the physical environment you're in and what's uh you know we've gone through you know we i think we talked about about three months ago and at that point we all had to feel we were starting to see an end light for end of the tunnel it was like positive moves you know both in in europe the us and yeah and then a lot have happened around the globe different different places different situation and lockdowns and so on but it feels like we are moving away from the pandemic and you know we want to again to accelerate the world because i could imagine as well for you guys it, it was it, it's been a weird period where people have trying to figure out what is the next thing we're going to do? What, how are we going to place our investments? And what is the next move in hospitality? But what, what's going on when you look at it from a landscape building point of view? What are the mega trends after the pandemic, if we can say so, post-pandemic? Yeah, I, and I, I look at it from more of a development point of view. Um, our, our clients are developers, and they not only develop hotels and communities, uh, but most of most of the luxury hotels also have a real estate component. And I can tell you right now that even during the pandemic, the real estate market, um, the branded real estate market, it was getting um, uh, very hot. And, and um, there was a lot of activity, a lot of sales activities. So projects that might have started to go on hold during the pandemic are now um, back to full design mode. Um, they're in full sales mode. Uh, real estate, uh, residential resort real estate, second homes are selling, um, and and there's a lot of activity in the market all around the world. People want their own private places to go away with their families where they feel safe. Um, and so, uh, you know, resort uh, residential um, has become, you know, in very high demand. So we see that. Um, 
is a really bright spot. Um, it's helped keep us busy through uh, the pandemic. And now that we're coming out of the pandemic, it's just um, we have a lot of work in, in that market. And, um, um, you know, I can see it lasting for quite a while. So even though vaccination rates are up and, you know, we're starting to distribute it across the world, but before the whole of the world is vaccinated, we're probably going to see, you know, I don't know, I had a, I'm not a scientist, but I guess we're talking five to 10 years before we really can say that all outskirts of the world is fully vaccinated for for COVID as long we need to deal with it. And what you're saying is that like privacy is important for people and going to a safe place, a place I know, before actually we want to travel the world, we want to have the flexibility. And you can see that has changed over the pandemic. Like there's a different demand. It's a bit going reverse, full circle back to how it was before airline tickets was affordable. I think people are really cherishing, you know, spending time with their families in a safe environment. That's why this the resort real estate, the branded real estate market is is uh, is so strong right now. And, you know, this branded real estate is serviced by the hotel um, flags. And um, and right now, that's that's where the market's at. So I, you know, I think we're going to get to a day probably, you know, within the next year or so that people are going to feel safe with traveling throughout Europe and going around the U.S. and in, in, in more of a, you know, sort of public sort of travel. But, um, uh, you know, it's just going to take a little bit more hard work to get over that hump and feel safe, um, not only um, traveling as a visitor, but for what we do in our business. You know, it's very important that we go and see the properties that we're designing and interface with the clients and the other consultants on the project. So, um, you know, we're looking forward to the day where um, all the protocols that we have now to be safe are a little less stringent um, and the demands on travel aren't, aren't as, as, um, as strenuous. It's, it's tough to travel these days. You know, some of my partners who are doing a lot of travel have to get vaccinated before, vaccinated when they arrive, vaccinated during their trips and vaccinated to come home. I'm not vaccinated, I'm sorry, tested. So this continued testing during your travels, especially with international travels is, um, you know, it's very difficult. And um, and so we're looking forward to uh, for the day where we get back to normal. Yeah, and I guess that that's the disruption for, for business travel. And then I guess also like the, the lack of tourism. We've definitely seen this, you know, here in the UK where I'm, especially London, have seen a lack of tourism and also areas where normally a lot of American tourists would come to the UK as well. I think Ireland has really felt it this summer as well that the tourist hasn't arrived from, from the US, for example. And I guess, as you say, that this staycation trend is here to stay in some kind as we take small steps to feeling more safe as consumers. Yeah, I think when somebody's going to invest, um, you know, in a in a vacation home, they're going to it's going to be a legacy for their family. So it's going to be a, a place where their family can gather a few times a year um, and uh, it becomes a legacy for the family it gets passed on through the generations. I don't think it's ever going to uh, you know, replace like going to London and spending a week, uh, you know, with your family or your wife or, um, and enjoying London, one of the greatest cities in the world. Um, it's not going to replace spending a long weekend in New York or, or, you know, I just had friends that went to Paris just to see the new Christo exhibit. Um, and, um, you know, th they're still going to do what they, they felt they wanted to do. They did it in a safe way, but, um, that that travel will come back. You know, as a family, we canceled our trip to, to London um, last summer uh, just because of, you know, safety factors. So um, it'll be back. It's maybe not back as soon as we wanted it. It will be, though. But in the meantime, this whole resort residential market, um, again, this is long term legacy for families. It's not something that, you know, you're going to buy a house and, and just use it for a few years. It's something you'll pass down through generations um and uh and it and it's it's sort of combined with you know the the travel we just talked about to the major major cities and and that will be back one day hopefully soon
Yeah, I uh, we we all we all want that to happen because uh, we, we we need the tourism to make hospitality work and leisure as well. Um, going on for that, what are the uh, trends, uh, Rich, that you really see that are you know have maybe changed or just been accelerated now in general for for hospitality when it comes to build you know spaces because you know we talked about demands of consumers and the one things I found out through some research we've done and some other thing is that the consumers are coming back more savvy than ever. And they really want high value for their money when they spend it. So when you go to a restaurant or you go to a hotel and you go travel, like that experience has to be in, in the top end of things. And I guess the space you're in really is a starting point often for that experience because you are, leaving home, you could get the food at home that we learned that in pandemic, you get the same food at home, but now you're going to that space and it has to be an experience. Yeah. And, and there's a couple of different ways that, that, you know, we look at, at um, aspects of uh, hospitality and, and what consumers want these days, what the guest wants, you know, obviously they want a great amenity program and we're landscape architects. So we're designing that amenity program, whether it's pools, and, and outdoor spa experiences, uh, trail systems, um, other, other amenities, um, uh, activity related. Um, and, you know, we feel that um, we're always continuing to, you know, do, you know, better pools and better activities uh, that are being designed. But, you know, like you said, the consumer is more savvy these days. They, they, they are more tuned into the environment. They want authentic experiences. They don't want something that's made up. They, they, they want to enjoy a lot about the history and the culture of the place that they're visiting. Um, they also want to know that you've paid attention um, to sustainability principles um, and doing things the right way. So we look at water usage on site uh, with irrigation. Um, try to maximize, um, you know, our use of water so that, you know, we're saving water. That means plant material selection. That means technology with irrigation systems, reusing stormwater and managing stormwater so it's not harming the environment, um, you know, bringing in bioswales. So there's a lot of um, technical things that we're starting to do these days that are very important the consumer knows a lot about that they didn't know a lot about uh, 20 years ago. And um, and so we have to be more sensitive to that, where we're designing and how we're building a project. It's really important that um, consumers feel comfortable. And um, and then there's the whole wellness movement. You know, they, they want uh, a product that um, is going to make them uh, more healthy in their whole lives. And so there's a lot with the whole wellness movement that is really um, uh, a big movement these days. Yeah, there's a really an emphasis on health, and I heard that from other conversations as well in general. Uh, you know, also the food you serve, the the especially when you travel, the uh, opportunity to exercise. You know, all those good habits you did during the pandemic. You know, people want to keep those habits, and they don't want to ex- short term. Uh, or should be short change for their for that you know they want to be able to go and swim the amenities you talked about and the quality of them has to be quite good because they also have to look very clean because or else you don't feel safe uh i you know lot, lots of my friends and uh people i know like they are not the certain public toilets they don't want to use because they just say it's not clean enough and that, that that's you know that's an issue there's no infrastructure issues and same come for restaurants Again, it really has to be cleaner than ever. Uh, and, you know, you need to think about that. Also comes back to the wellness and health aspects of it. Yeah. And, and I mean, it's you brought up a really good point. We have a very um, uh, long-term client um, with Hard Rock uh, International. And Hard Rock is now building all over the world. Um, and they built some, um, uh, since they're owned by um, uh, an entity in Southern Florida, they built a couple large facilities in Southern Florida. Um, but Hard Rock as a corporation has brought in a company called Ecolab. And Ecolab usually worked for hospitals and industry. And, and now Hard Rock has brought them into the, the hotel business to help them create programs to be sure that their hotels, their restaurants, their casinos, their event venues, their concert venues are using the latest technology to keep the guests safe 
and make the guests feel comfortable. And I think that's um, that shows the leadership of that company to spend that kind of money to be sure that they are ensuring the guest experience. And, you know, five years ago, nobody would have thought of that. Now it's like everyday thoughts that, you know, to make sure everything is is clean and, and guests feel comfortable. It's really important, I think. Yeah, and uh, and it's it, it interesting that actually they have gone and found you know probably one of the best partners for that in the world because it's 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 become a fundamental in a way. It's always been a fundamental. Cleanliness have always been a fundamental, but it's at a different level now. You also mentioned sustainability, and you know there's been a lot of talk about sustainability. That word, you know, everybody knows the word, but maybe sometimes how they is expressed and a lot of confusion around. And I guess, you know, when we talk about sustainability is doing the right thing, as I always call it, the right thing for people, communities and the planet. Have you seen that as well in the projects you're working on now that this has come on the forefront? Really need to get in detail about, you know, the sustainability, the uh, recycling, you know, uh, reusing things. Is that really important now in projects as, as, as you see in the future and now what you're working on? Yeah, I think it's, you know, for landscape architects, it's practices that we have been doing throughout our career, but now they're being uh, brought to the forefront in a, with a different awareness um, because in, you know, 30 years ago, um, people really didn't focus on that. The guests didn't focus on that. Um, but now, like I said, and like you said, guests are much more savvy and and they're much more concerned about the environment. So some of the things we've been doing for years, um, but there's new technologies that help you get those done in a better way. Um, you know, stormwater is a big deal, especially in coastal environments. And we have to understand how to manage stormwater on a complicated site um, with many buildings and, you know, where that stormwater goes, how it gets cleaned before it goes back into the ocean or the aquifer. Um, so that's a very important part of landscape architecture. Um, use of irrigation, um, especially in a lot of a um, uh, lot of arid climates where we work a lot. Um, there's new technologies with irrigation. You have limits on water, how much water you can use. It affects your plant palate. So we have to be very, very focused on creating an environment that not only um, optimizes the use of water so it's not wasted, but also starts to regenerate itself. And it's a regenerative uh, landscape design is what we're calling it. And so it, it doesn't need to, you know, it sort of helps take care of itself over time. As it matures, it needs less water. It, it seeds itself. It, it, it's, it starts to um, really adapt to its environment um, in a more naturalistic way. And so we're looking at landscape in those ways. And and clients understand that. They get it. They see the results of it when they're experiencing um, these resorts and these communities that we're building. And, uh, and, they, and I can tell you, they feel much more comfortable when they're in these spaces, when they're in these, um, in, in these projects. And, and that's what it's really about, about making the guests feel comfortable. Uh, and, 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 and they're spending their money, whether they're buying real estate or spending you know, a weekend or a week at a hotel. And they want to enjoy themselves. So, um, you know, it's it's really it really all goes back to the guest experience. But like you said, it's also about doing the right thing. And um, and we really have to pay attention to those things. Yeah. And I guess the, uh, the the size of the project from a community point of view has can have huge impact, both positive and, and negative, if you don't really think this through. As, as we we go forward, especially, you know, with sea levels rising and, and so on. Yeah, so the, doing the right thing becomes more and more important for, for everyone. And it's, it's key for that we all contribute to, to, to stop climate change or reverse climate change. I normally would rather use that word. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure landscape architects are, you know, we're going to contribute to helping um, mitigate climate change in a lot of things we do, but it's going to take a very long time. Um, but in the meantime, we can help projects be more resilient to what's happening right now. So re resiliency is a, a big part of how we look at, at projects, especially coastal projects, uh, pre especially projects that uh, are in areas that might be prone to flooding. Um, 
you know, we're doing a project in Biscayne Bay with a developer and the Army Corps of Engineers wanted to build a concrete seawall to protect a piece of Biscayne Bay. And the developer wanted a different, more aesthetic, more usable solution. So we, uh, with a, a marine um, engineering group um, uh, based in uh, in Florida, we came up with a solution that was much more aesthetic that created a series of berms and dunes to protect this property and, instead of a, a, a series of engineered seawalls. Now, these dunes are also act as a park and, um, and are aesthetically pleasing and mitigate um, the storm surge just as well if not better than a seawall. It also promotes habitat development. So sea turtles and all kinds of marine life are starting to thrive in these environments and make the bay cleaner, actually. So you have to look at projects that way on, on what's the right thing to do. Now, it's probably going to cost a little bit more money, but I think right now these days the consumer is willing to pay a little bit more for a project that is that that contributes to the environment instead of taking away. So I think we're at that stage finally where awareness has matured to a point where, where the consumer is willing to pay for that as well. Yeah, and I think you don't need to tell people climate change is happening. I think, I think we all are aware now. We just need to find out what to, to do about it, as you say. And every small action in the right direction is important here. At EDSA, you are, you know, you're perceived from, from the outside world, uh, be some of the best at what you do. And you know you spend some lot five de- more than five decades to to get to that point. And actually, I'm always been very interested. I know a lot of people listening to the show as well. You know, greatness or excellence or whatever word you use. How how do you uh, get to that space? How do you corner that? What was like? You know, because often it's something to do with humans coming together and some philosophy and standards. But what what is your secret sauce in your business? Well, I, I think I think it it started, you know, early on when our founder Ed Stone Jr. and it's been just over six decades, um, by the way. Um, but our founder Ed Stone, um, you know, he looked at his father's firm. And his father sort of was this famous guy that sort of ruled his firm, and Ed wanted to take a different approach and build a collection of what he called peers, which were the partners at the time, the original partners, and where everybody would have a say in in how a project got developed. But one of Ed's big philosophies was building the right team and bringing the, because we don't know everything uh, and and we have to collaborate to make a project successful. So that whole collaboration theme has run throughout our history and has been embraced by us uh, partners in the second generation. And Ed also taught us really the main thing is to listen to your client, listen to your fellow consultants and understand their point of view. Don't always try to be the loudest voice in the room. Leave your ego at the door. You're part of a team and um, you're going to become a better leader by listening and helping solve problems as, as a cohesive team rather than trying to, you know, be the superstar of the project. And it's really served us well over the years. Clients like working with somebody like EDSA who contributes to the greater good of the team. And it's uh, it served us well. And actually we enjoy our work a lot more when we're collaborating that way. And I guess these, uh, this philosophy is still on top of mind as you, you build the company and growing the company. And you said you had about 170 people around the globe. How do you continue maintaining it as you grow? Because that's actually the question often people say, you know, you have a, small team when you start out like the family and then it becomes the the group of friends and then it becomes suddenly it becomes a business and you know you're not able to be face to face with everyone all the time and how how have you maintained that what practical things have you put in place to keep on living those principles from the from the outset it's a great question and you know we have i think um over the years we've had this almost a homegrown leadership within EDSA. So I started when I graduated college in 1985. I went to college a little bit late, but I did get done with college. And um, and I worked for a couple partners at EDSA that taught me how to be a leader, taught me how to be a partner, and eventually 
uh, had my own studio and, um, and, and grew that studio. And now I've mentored uh, two or three other guys who now are partners. And so, you know, in the early days, it was a bit informal. You work hard, you listen to the, your leader, you work with him, you learn uh, from your mentor. Now it's, it's actually, we have it a little bit more formalized. So we have leadership training internal to the firm. Um, and it's very important for us to give young people an opportunity very early in their career to get out on their own and, 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 and contribute um, in, in meaningful ways, not just be somebody cranking away at, on the computer to produce a set of documents. They have to contribute from the early days of the, the conceptual design. Um, they get to meet the client early on. Um, they get to understand the business side of it early on, how to write proposals, how to scope out pr projects, uh, write a scope of work. So we make it a, an extra effort to really involve the young people in all aspects of the business. And then they sort of find their way of what they really want to do within the business. Some people want to be more on the technical side. Some people want to be more on the creative side. Some people are really good at client relationships and in in business development. And so, um, but it's this sort of, you know, openness of the principles to really uh, pass down their knowledge to the next generation because they're going to be the company in the future. And, um, and, and when we're all retired and in, enjoying, you know, our weekend home in Tuscany or something like that. So um, it's really important uh, to continue the business. That's why we've been in business 60 years. And I don't think you see that a lot in, in landscape architecture. No, I don't think you see that a lot. If I don't know what the average lifetime on the, the American business market is, but I think here in the UK, we're talking just around the average of five, six years now. And, you know, and, you know, also I think there's a big sur survey done on the general stock market and many companies don't last more than 12 to 14 years. And before in the, in the past, not many decades ago, you saw companies being, you know, around for hundred years, you know, and yeah, so it's it's interesting that you're still doing. It. I think it's very interesting as well. It seems like you're creating business people more than you are creating employees. Every employee has a chance to become an owner in the firm. We have right now we have 24 shareholders, and they're all principals right now. And um, we've explored other ways of of bringing ownership of the company beyond just the principals. But we have 24 principals, and and you know there's some firms that do what we do, that might there might be a single owner. 100% he owns the whole company and he might have 40 employees and nobody has a chance of owning any of it. There might be, you know, two or three owners in a company of 60 or 70 people and, and that's it. Um, so as you grow within the firm, there's always the opportunity to become an owner. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, for guys like me back in the mid nineties, when I had about 10 or 12 years experience, I had that opportunity to become, have ownership in the company. And not everybody wants that, but that was definitely part of my goal. And we have to be sure that you're mentoring um, the young people in the right way so they grow into that role. It's not just something that you give to somebody. They obviously, they, they have to earn it. And, and, um, and so we make a, a, a conscious effort to really develop leaders within the firm um, who will be the owners of the future. And I think once you're an owner, um, you feel more um, committed to the firm. And, uh, and, and it just helps with, um, you know, it, it's, it's helped with our longevity in the business. And, and, you know, I think clients actually look at that as a very consistent um, performance by a firm. And so that makes clients and, and developers feel much more comfortable that there's this consistency over many years with EDSA where they don't always see that with other firms. And I think when you talk about our value out there to the industry, that's, that's got to be a part of it because that consistency is what, what owners really need. Yeah, and I think also to deal with the uncertainty for any business right now, I think you're spot on that. Actually, you know, we like when we do business with people that they are the same people lot of you you're in the you you do business with people not with a brand or a product 
of the people within that. And I think it's very key. You said, I think we had Ari, uh, uh, Ari from Singerman's on as well, uh, a well-known American uh, food business up in Ann Arbor. And I don't know if you know about them, but they had like 16 business run by the employees then created them into to business people, similar kind of approach. And, and they have now, I think it's almost five decades behind them as well uh, of, of business. And that comes from, you know, again, it's spilled from the bottom up and not from the top down. And it's very interesting because that's been a lot of talk about that, the new way of working. And you're already, you're already doing that. And I, I really all like the word you're, you're mentioning the word mentor. And it seems like it's very important for you to not you, but the business that has mentor role. And there's been this massive research done with a guy called Clint Pulver in the US and organizations. You are interviewing 10,000 millennials asking them what they really want from their company or boss. And they want mentorship. Yeah, salary salary has to be checked off, but and it has to be exciting brand to work for a business. But actually, really, the mentorship is the most important bit for them. Yeah, I, I think it's it's very very important. Uh, the young people need to feel like they're a part of the firm and they're contributing and they're learning. And you know, I, there's a lot of young people that, um, you know, they look up to uh, guys like me and my other partners who have been here 30, 35 years. Uh, I just celebrated my 36th anniversary at EDSA uh, last month or, or in August. And and so they look up to us They and and they they have a lot of questions. They, they have a lot of uh, yearning to learn more. And, you know, I was given that opportunity to learn from some guys that are re- really good at what they do. And I need I need to pass that down to the younger people. And, you know, I think um, as we get older, we really, as, as owners, we, we really want to find our purpose in what we do as, as professionals. And I think, you know, some of us um, in the, in the partnership role um, really feel that mentoring is probably the most important thing we can do uh, for our company and also for the business, because some of the people that we mentor are not going to stay with EDSA. We have a huge alumni all around the world, not just in the U.S., of former EDSA employees that learned. They spent five, ten years with EDSA and went on and did something else. And we supported that. It's not something that we look at with um, with any bad thoughts. It's it's we 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 feel and we're proud of. You know the young people that didn't stay as well as the young people that do stay so it's it's very interesting to hear because also because i guess it's so important that you know relationship you have with your your customers as well that these people they can see they are improving all the time because you are selling innovation in the in the end of the day when i look at it like your ability to make innovation within the organization is very key, I think, for what you do. So is that also, does that innovation actually a result of being innovative? Does that come from that way of structuring your your culture, build on the philosophy you talked about? Do you see that innovation comes easier then when you do these amazing projects? Yeah, it, 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 it has to be um, that you're allowing the younger people to do what they do best and, and to help them learn along the way because because of innovation. Innovation is so connected to technology these days. A guy like me who's in his early 60s, who's been here 36 years, um, is not going to learn how to do 3D modeling on a computer. Um, The young people coming out of school, they know that like they can tie their shoes. And it's, it's not even, they don't even have to give it a second thought. So the tools we have to do our job these days are so much further advanced than when I started 36 years ago. It's amazing. It's like night and day. And it helps us do a better job as a team. But the young people are really the ones that are pushing that innovation with all this new technology. It's amazing how we concept a project these days. We're immediately in three dimension. We can communicate our ideas to the client uh, so much easier. That also becomes marketing material for um, the owners, the clients, when they go to, to open a hotel or they are selling real estate. Um, so we're creating, you know, um, all the all the graphic work that we produce really, really flows through the project even after it's open. But it's all that 
innovation is really being led by the younger people. Obviously, it's being supported by the partnership, but the young people are really so amazing these days with the tools they have to do the work that we need to do and do the right thing like we talked about earlier. It's it, They just have such a great outlook. And um, you know that's the exciting part of my business is seeing how these young people are looking at how they can improve um, the projects and ultimately improve the quality of life, whether it's a, a community for market rate housing for everyday life or, or, or a resort community or a public park or some pro bono work we're doing for our own communities, which is very important to EDSA as well. So it's, it's, it's inspiring to me um, at this part of my career to see how these young people are grasping the issues at hand, um, you know, uh, climate change um, and, and all the other issues that we have to deal with um, in our business. It's, uh, it's really inspiring. And it's, it's super interesting you're saying that technology is actually a friend as well to, to help you, you as a business. Um, me moving on from, from that, you know, we, we've gone through a pandemic and even though you have lots of experience uh, as a leader and, and, and business owner as well, and, you know, technical experience, you know, I guess that like nobody else, you were, you were not prepared for this and didn't know from, from the outset what to do. What, what has been your biggest learning in all this? Like, is there something where you think really like I, that was really, that was like when you reflected and look back, like this, this has really changed the game for me or the playbook in some kind of way. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's two, two aspects of the pandemic. One is if we were a normal company, we would have to deal with not going to the office every day, right? Which everybody had to deal with. So the financial guys in New York and the, the artists in Los Angeles and the businesses in Chicago that go to these big office buildings, they had to work from home every day. And we had to do the same. That's one thing. But, you know, our business is about, you know, site design and planning. And you have to go visit the places that you are working on. And so we travel a lot and we meet clients face to face. We uh, we have work all over the world, you know, and to all of a sudden, like within one week, have all that shut down and really still not return to normal yet. I have, I have some partners who are traveling, some partners who are not traveling. I'm not traveling yet. I think I made one trip in July. It was my first trip in over a year. And I felt like a little kid in a candy store because I hadn't been you know, out at a, a project in, in over a year. So um, to have to deal with that was also, um, but our clients were also dealing with it. And we were already very prepared with the platforms that everybody's using now because we were already using those platforms. We already had a way to get into our network to retrieve information to be able to do our work, whether it was drawings or um, or just, you know, information that, that I would need. Um, and then we also had the platforms for all the video conferencing. So we had already been using all that stuff all along. It's just, you know, we were using it every day instead of occasionally. So, um, you know, I think the biggest lesson is you have to really understand, you know, how you care about each other, how you, you're concerned for one another to be sure that everybody is communicating and everybody's okay. And, and, um, and then you have to get into sort of um, a routine that you might not be normal to. You have to really um, be consistent um, throughout your, your day. Otherwise, you might get lost, you know, somewhere around your house and not come back to work. So um, it's, uh, it's not been easy, but I think we've been really successful at it. And it, I think it's strengthened the communication within our firm. And I know it's strengthened communication with a lot of our client groups as well and a lot of our consultants that we work with. So uh, all in all, there's been some good that has come out of the pandemic. Um, you know, it's not been, it's not been all bad. Uh, and it's interesting. It's, it's about how do you then, you know, how we keep that as we, we come back all these good behaviors we have on in different parts of our life, especially the communication bit I've heard before. And lots of people are, how are we going to keep on communicating as well? We need to, that's, that was the learn. We didn't do that well enough pre-pandemic and that's quite interesting on your journey uh, rich who has been you know 
you know, you don't have to be three, you could be two as well. But who is the, some of the most influential people? Probably your mentors, coming back to the mentor conversation. Yeah, I mean, you know, I have to start with my parents. And, um, you know, um, they were just great people. And, uh, you know, middle class America and upstate New York, I had a, a great life growing up, a lot of outdoor time. Um, and, you know, my dad, uh, he didn't finish high school and uh, he decided his senior year of high school to to leave high school, lie about his age and join the uh, at the time it was the Army Air Corps. It was the pre uh, predecessor to the U.S. Air Force. And he he went into World War II, um, you know, at 17 when you really needed to be 18. And um, he was in North, Northern Africa and Italy during the war. And, you know, he was really proud of serving his country. Um, and he sacrificed a lot to do that. Um, and he came home and he didn't really talk about it that much. But, you know, he, he just wanted to serve others. So I, I looked at and my dad was such an outgoing person and cared about people and was always doing something for somebody else. Um, and, uh, and so that was the beginning and then coming to work at EDSA, meeting Ed Stone Jr. Amazing man. It, he just, um, is just somebody that, you know, I think about almost every day. Um, even though he, he's, he's been gone for about 11 years or so, he's just was such a good person and cared about people so much. And I try to pass that on down to the younger people that didn't know Ed Stone. And then some of the partners I worked with at EDSA were amazing people. Um, you know, Dave Armbruster, who's now retired, Bob Bailing, who who really taught me uh, a lot about what I do today. Um, and it really helped me grow within the firm and become a partner. Um, great people that I learned the, the profession, the craft of landscape architecture. I learned the business of landscape architecture and uh, and cons consulting and then outside and i know i've already mentioned three or four but one i have to mention is you know uh saul kirshner who um was the uh chairman and ceo of kirshner who developed um he's a south african businessman who developed the atlantis brand the one and only brand and um you know we're still working for kirshner today although Saul sold the company and Saul passed away about a year and a half ago. Um, but we worked with Saul for 25, 27 years. And uh, for about 10 years, that was my only uh, client. We were doing multiple projects around the world and I you know, had daily communication with him um, as a young uh, person in the business. And he just you know, he was very hands on. So it was amazing to be working with the CEO of a company and communicating with him every day. And he built a great team. I saw how he built his team. And I brought some of that back to EDSA on how we build our teams within EDSA. Surround yourself with great people and uh, and treat people really well. You can still be a tough person, but you, you have to really treat um, you know your colleagues and your employees really well. So uh, he was a, a great person and he was always very honest and um and and very fair with everybody so um i really enjoyed that as well oh, that was some great great examples uh rich and uh, um what would be your um you know the last question of our my conversations always you know what would you from you're viewing hospitality from a different lens maybe than a hospitality leader but in general to leaders out there in the industry suppliers or supporters experts uh, operators what is, would your be your you know like top three advice if you could get the stage and you know and we start to look a bit with the future lens as well on things yeah i mean as leaders um you know you have to um i think first off be very forward thinking and and you, you can't these days especially i think in hospitality um but in many industries, you can't like look back and and repeat all of your successes, because if you do that, it'll be just the same old thing. So you really have to be forward thinking. And <clears throat> there's a lot of groups out there that are like that. Saul Kirshner was one of those guys, very forward thinking, always wanting 
to do something better for the guest. Um, and then I think I mentioned it earlier, you know, surround yourself with really good people. Ed Stone did that when he formed EDSA. It was different than his father's company. It, it, he surrounded himself with what he called equals, and he everybody contributed to making a great company. And and you can't do it all yourself. You have to really rely on your partners and, and your colleagues in the business. And so, you know, just bring smart people to the table, collaborate. That's really good. And then, you know, I think I think you also need to take care of yourself. You, you have to really, um, you know, these days we can get so wrapped up with Zoom calls starting at 5 a.m. till 10 at night um, because of our international business. And you really have to take the time for yourself and your family. I haven't done the best job at that. I'm starting to realize that more, especially with the pandemic and being home as much as I have uh, been lately. But if you don't take care of yourself, number one, you're not going to have as much fun. You're not going to live as long. And number two, your 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 employees, your team members are, are going to see that. And they look up to you, so you have to set the example. We've been having a, a, a huge conversation in the firm at the, at the ownership level about you know, the, the work-life balance because the pandemic has really exacerbated um, how hard we work because, you know, you can't be there in person. So you're focusing now instead of on one thing at a time when you travel, you're home and you're focusing on 10 things. And like I said, our day can start at 3 a.m., 5 a.m. in the morning and go all the way till midnight if we, if we you know, had to be on every call. And we can't, so we have a, a great team that can handle a lot of that. But, but you have to take care of yourself. You can't work yourself to death. You have to take time during the day, and um, and really um, take those breaks to, uh, you know, create a healthy environment. And um, I mean, that's probably one of the most important things. Yeah, I think that was like you know some really great advice in there, like uh, leading leading yourself on a on a different level and actually you know listening to those signals as you said and actually carve out that time and make it a ritual to do that. And I think I really like the the run around team and I think that's like being in the right team both ways. You know, choose the right team, but also choose your the right people to be in that team. Like first, who then what? I think Jim Collins he said as well, and I think that has become more important for people than ever like really my friends and stuff like that who are the people i'm surrounded with what i'm getting besides you know a good conversation how i'm learning how do i feel those in a dynamic do i feel like I'm, we're like-minded in a way but still we can still grow within that and i really love the way you said that your previous success and um, we just done a big work on it's called from fragile to agile and where we actually talk about that whole ability as leaders to unlearn what gave you success in the past and actually be forward thinking, as you said, like actually start to learn new things. So like first unlearn and say, accept that's what you did in the past. It's not going to work now. You need to learn some new things. Um, and is that quite difficult? We all have it on different parts in our life, that thing where we are doing something, but it worked in the past, but it's not giving me the results I want now. Um, so yeah, really, really great advice there, Rich. Um, any uh, anywhere people can go and find out more about uh, you and uh, ESDA, uh, what's the best place to go? Yeah, um, edsaplan.com, and um, it'll show some of our projects. It'll show all of our leadership, including uh, myself, and um, <clears throat> and and then there's also some um, some uh, thought articles there about um, some of our projects and some of our philosophies. Um, there's also some takeaways there, and we're in the process of redoing our whole website, but the the address won't change. Um, hopefully, we'll be done with that uh, uh, before the end of the first quarter next year. But um, it's a it's a great place to go and learn more about EDSA and um, about the leadership and and uh, and about the work we do. Great, great. Thank you so much for for coming on the uh, the show and sharing your, your wisdom and insights. And I send you and the wider team, you know, all the power and energy you need to to, to bounce back from the pandemic. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. This has been very enjoyable and I appreciate your uh, your time today. 
Thank you so much, Rich, for sharing your insights on the mega trends for property and design in the hospitality industry and how to build great company culture. I would recommend you now to sit down with pen and paper and ask yourself, are your properties ready to meet the demands of the future when it comes to the employees and customers' expectations? To get further inspiration on how to build great design that lives up to what employees and customers expect, please tune in to episode number 30, setting the stage for the best hospitality experience with David Chenery, who is the founder and director of Objects Based Place. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please share, rate, review, or subscribe to one of our channels. A big thank you to Biz Simply for supporting us, bringing great insights, strategies, and tools to help the industry thrive, not just survive. Check them out at bizsimply.com on their social at BizSimply or BizSimplyHQ. And you can also email them directly on advice at BizSimply.com. A big thank you to Fina Charlson, who is the show producer and editor from the Podcast Collective. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter and download free leadership tools at hospitalitymavericks.com. And don't worry, if you didn't get all of this, there will be links in the show notes. I'm Michael Tinkser. And you've been listening to the Hospitality Maverick Podcast Show. Be Maverick.